Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of What's the Juice podcast and happy July 1st. I cannot believe that it's already July and that we've just completed half of the year of What's the Juice. It has been such a fun journey. I hope you guys are loving the episode so far. And I figured I would give you guys a little bit of an update since I haven't really been on social media and Instagram. And I'm mainly saying hi and interacting with you guys through the podcast. So hello. What have I been up to? I have not been posting on my Instagram nearly as much these days. I think I've kind of come to a bit of a slow halt gradually over the last few years. I've kind of alluded to it a bit. I mentioned at the top of this season that I was going to be stepping back from social media more and focusing more of my energy on the podcast and on the next iteration of what I'm planning to do with my platform as a whole. And it has been really nice to take the time away from constantly documenting and producing your life on social media, even when you have the best of intentions. (laughs) Because I think that, you know, the social media world, the Instagram world can be an incredible vehicle for change. And I really hope that this podcast is continuing to be helpful to you guys and a vehicle for change. But at the same time, Instagram kind of makes it hard for you to continue the constant death and rebirth process that it is to be a human because you always have to be kind of translating yourself as you show up online. And I think when you're so used to showing up a certain way, but internally you're going through such a massive shift, it's really hard to communicate what that shift looks like and who this new person you're becoming is when, again, you're like trying to fit in the old box of who you used to be and how you used to show up. And you're also like a little baby deer. Like, how do I start to show the person that I am birthing myself into in little ways when I'm just getting to know her? And I think that's kind of the process that I'm in and why I've stepped back so much from posting on Instagram because Instagram is like this 2D kind of like cardboard cutout version of you that again, you have to like intentionally put out there in a certain way, even if you're not trying to. And as I've been in such a period of death and rebirth in my life as a person, in my career, trying to figure out what I want to do next in the world to really make an impact and do something powerful with the platform that I've so kindly been given. It's been, it's felt unnatural to continue kind of like showing up the way I used to. And it's also felt a little bit unnatural. And I felt like I'm stumbling a bit trying to show up as this in-between person who's in the void of who I'm becoming. So the best thing that I found to do is just take that step back and allow that sacred pause and just trust that the more I put in the real life work to become the person that I'm going to be, the easier it will be to show up as that person when I'm ready to. And I'm starting to feel ready and I'm starting to concretize the next chapter of what I want to do, not just with Organic Olivia, but just again, like with my platform as a whole. And I'm really excited about it. I just spent the month of June taking time off. I think if you guys have been following me for a few years now, you know that that's something I do each summer. Instead of going on vacation and traveling somewhere in the world or to a destination, I try to take a vacation in my own life because I think that quite often we don't give ourselves a chance to appreciate the life that we're creating right here at home because so much of our time in our home is spent either working or doing housework or taking care of everyone else around us or staying busy and kind of playing forever catch up with our to-do lists. And so we don't often get all that much time to actually just be in the lives that we've created and just look around and say, oh my goodness, this is my life. I get to go slow and make coffee in the morning and bake muffins and enjoy the breeze and plant flowers outside my window. And so I try to take that reflective period each summer and I just finished a few weeks off. And it's funny because originally I did have travel plans and I went on them and I realized 
this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. And I actually came home and I just spent two weeks converting a portion of my yard into not just a garden, but like a farm. Like we're, we're building an herb farm over here. And it has been nonstop days of manual labor. I'm covered in poison ivy right now. <laughs> I have calamine lotion everywhere. And it has been the most rewarding labor of my life. And it kind of helped me to remember who I am through that ancestral connection with the land. And it's been really special. And I never thought I would be this person who's like excited to get up and pull weeds and till soil and <laughs> make compost and water plants and prune my plants. Like I am obsessed right now. It's been so nice and so rewarding. And I want to share it with people eventually, which I'll talk about in a moment. But yeah, I've been like creating an entire herb garden at home and also making a lot of flower essences. So as an herbalist, you know, I'm used to making tinctures and oils and salves and things of that nature. And I was always really called to flower essences, but I never really had a practice of making them before. But when I unexpectedly came home from my trip early and realized that I needed to be at home, I immediately, as soon as I came home, was drawn to this bush of flowers outside of my house and I became obsessed with them and I couldn't stop thinking about them. And it just popped into my mind, like it's time for you to start making flower essences. It's time for you to start getting into this kind of herbal medicine that's more about the energetic and the emotional and the spiritual and all of the things that you've been talking about are so important when it comes to the picture of health that so many of us neglect because we're focusing on the physical and the perfect diet and the supplements. It's funny how you can walk around the world and there's flowers and plants all around you at all times, even if you live in a city. And yet when you're not attuned to the awareness of the gravity of the plants and the flowers around you, or you don't know them by name, or you're not curious about them and you just kind of walk around and live your life, it's so easy to just not notice them. But then once you become curious and once you kind of attune your consciousness to actually learning about and meeting the flowers around you and it becomes something in your mind that you start to recognize and look for all around you, you begin to notice flowers and magic everywhere and the entire world becomes this secret garden playground and you're like i've been surrounded by this stuff all my life and yet i was never curious enough to know these things and now i feel like i have friends everywhere because i can recognize this flower here and this one here and it just add so much depth and joy to life. And so all of that to say, I started making these flower essences. They're very small batch and they're energetic remedies. I'm gonna do a whole solo episode about flower essences now that it's my jam. And it's kind of reignited my love for herbalism. And I think it's an avenue that I wanna go down in terms of actually teaching people and doing workshops in person, which is gonna be really fun. But um, yeah, that's what I've been doing the last few weeks. And since I have a chance to chat with you, I wanna encourage you guys to go outside and start getting curious about the flowers and the land and the plants around you and see what you find. Download the app, picture this, start to identify flowers that you see, start to look up flower essences. You can type in the flower name and flower essence and read about the energetic properties of the flowers and see the layers of richness and depth that you can unlock in your normal everyday mundane life by starting to notice all of that abundance around you. But that's what I've been doing. I've been gardening and making flower essences. I've reignited my love for herbalism in a really big way. I'm starting to understand the kind of workshops and gatherings that I'd wanna do with people in person. And I'm also starting to kind of figure out the next stage of what I wanna do in my career, which actually involves gathering people in person, building community in person in a real way and getting off the internet a lot more. So once my team and I figure that out, I'll have a lot more announcements for you guys, but I just wanna kind of keep you posted with my stream of consciousness as it comes through. My dream would be to somehow take these podcast guests and these amazing teachers that I get to meet through my field and bring them to you guys in real life for classes and workshops. So I'm really kind of masterminding a collaborative way to do that in an in-person space or way. So just manifest with me, you guys. Other than that, uh, I've just been enjoying continuing to release the podcast and share these episodes with you guys. And I really do hope that you're loving them. And today's episode is with Courtney Swan. <laughs> Courtney Swan has her master's in nutrition, and she's going to talk to us a ton about our food supply today. On the topic of farming and gardening and getting back in touch with the land, 
This episode is very much going to be about our current food supply and what has happened to our agricultural system with the advent of genetically modified foods and all of kind of like the corporate jargon and profit-based fallacies that were sold in order to get us to consume more GMOs and to get farmers kind of dependent on GMOs and what that's doing to our environment and our health. So we're gonna talk a lot about processed foods and the food supply and how that has changed over the years and farming practices and what we can do to kind of put the power back in our hands and start making healthier choices at the grocery store, start recognizing things like genetically modified ingredients and reading labels in a more astute way. And overall, just this episode is two gals who are very passionate about food and farming and our food supply. Kind of talking about the problem, of course, because it's important to understand the problem in order to illuminate the solutions. But we're very much talking about the changes that are happening and the very easy things that you can do at home to be aware of and combat these issues within our food supply. So a good food nutrition episode for those of you who kind of want to reignite your passion of like, wait, this is why I'm working so hard to eat healthy. This is why I'm going to the farmer's market and being really intentional about who I purchase from and what I'm purchasing. And I just loved this conversation and I love Courtney and I'm excited to share it with you guys. So thanks for always bearing with me and for being on this 10 plus year journey with me. Like when you're sharing yourself and your life on the internet for so many years and you go through changes and you have a community of like-minded individuals who are just there for it and are there for the ups and downs and highs and lows and the ways that things change and iterate, it means so much. And I just really appreciate all of your patience as I show up less and show up differently and go through my own internal changes. I think it'll be very much worth it for me to like have this space away to gain the perspective and figure out how to fully show up in the next chapter. And I just appreciate you guys being there for the next chapter if you so choose to be and if you still resonate with me as a human and kind of enjoy the direction in which I'm moving. So thanks for being here with me. Thanks for listening to the pod and I hope you love it. Okay, are you ready? You know, we feel each other's emotions. It's everything. It's living my life intentionally. That's the message, right? Absolutely. There's no difference between our mental health and our physical health. It's the same exact thing. And without further ado, let's get juicy. Welcome to the show, Courtney. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. It is always a pleasure when I get to talk nutrition with someone who is an expert in the field, where we get to kind of debate a little bit about the nuance. And obviously, you and I definitely live in a little bit of different worlds. I was just saying I'm from Yonkers, like born and raised. My folks are very Yonkers vibe. And every time I come to LA, I'm amazed at the high quality food options that are at my fingertips here. I'm not used to it. It feels... I feel so spoiled here. I'm like, oh my God, I can order from Goop Kitchen or I can go to Erewhon and everything's fresh and the produce is local. And then I'm going to head back home in a few weeks to the snow tundra in Yonkers and we we really have limited options. So it's cool that you and I are in very different worlds and we can kind of meet in the middle here and help folks find a more balanced approach to nutrition while still being aware of all of the corruption and the stuff going on in our food supply. Yeah, I love that. I can relate to you. So my, I sort of grew up in this really small mountain town called Telluride. Oh. And whenever I go home over Christmas, it's the accessibility of getting good produce in into that town yeah. is so hard mm-hmm. that every Christmas when my mom and I are there like trying to cook for the holidays, my mom's always like, it is so hard for us to get fresh produce here. Yep. And I'm coming from LA, like you said, where I mean, I go to farmer's market. There's a farmer's market every single day of the week here, basically. It's unbelievable. So it is really, there is a difference in the accessibility and it makes it harder. Yeah, for sure. So I think that's one layer of it. And then also people are becoming more aware of how uh, subsidized certain packaged foods are and certain crops are that aren't the best for us. They're becoming aware of the corruption in our food supply. And then we can easily get discouraged by being like, oh, my God, is everything toxic? Is everything bad for me? And I think it can go down a slippery slope for someone who's just starting off and trying to make healthier choices to just wade through the noise and be like, how can I find a happy medium for my family where I feel good about what I'm feeding them? And I'm also not anxious about every little ingredient 
and just getting that base of knowledge where folks just feel empowered to make better choices. So that's what I want to chat with you about today for I'm sure. Excited. Yeah. Um, and you are definitely so in the space. You're always educating people on, hey, here's the truth about this label. The stuff that's on the front of the package does not necessarily reflect what's actually in it. That's advertising on the front of the package. You're helping people cut through the noise in that sense. So I'd love for you to start. Uh, maybe you can just give us a little bit of your background, um, what you studied and what got you into nutrition, and then we can get into food corruption. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Straight in. Oh, my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my name is Courtney Swan, and I founded Real Foodology when I was getting my master's of science and nutrition and integrative health. I actually initially went down the RD track. I was the first year in, and I was really starting to see these corporate ties um, for example, Coca-Cola and General Mills were the largest supporters of Eat Right, which is their um, the sponsorship for the RD registered dietitian. Um, and so I saw this as a conflict of interest and me being the person that I am who really desires to help people without all this added noise. I wanted to learn what the truth was without this um, voice of big food having any sort of um, intervention into my education. And so I uh, took a year off. My parents were so mad at me, but I ended up finding the school, Maryland University of Integrative Health, and it was exactly what I wanted. It was very science-based, but then we also had um, a very holistic lens as well, which is noticing or recognizing that food is nourishment, food is healing, food is medicine. Mm. And so I got my master's. And while I was doing that, I created Real Foodology. It started as a simple recipe blog. Mm -hmm. And I was just posting recipes. I was posting tips. And I, during that time, I found people like Michael Pollan, Dr. Mark Hyman. And they started, they, they were talking about, more specifically, Michael Pollan was, um, he wrote this book where he dove into uh, America's industrialization past and how we got to, the, to where we got now with our yeah. food. And it sparked this interest in me. And I was just like, nobody is talking about this. Nobody really knows what's going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Everyone is getting sicker. We're getting sicker as a population year after year. And no one's talking about what's happening with our food. Everyone seems to be scratching their heads. They seem to be really confused. And to me, it seemed really obvious mm -hmm. with the industrialization of our food. And so I went down a um, big rabbit hole of this. I started talking about it on my Instagram. That's how I created Real Foodology on my Instagram and then now my podcast. So that's my background. It reminds me of the process that happened when the Rockefellers kind of got into the medical schools as yeah. well and started to change the curriculum to sort of standardize everything. And even it's a little known fact this also happened in traditional Chinese medicine. So yeah. there used to be uh, classical Chinese medicine, essentially, based on these original texts, the Shang Han Lun. And um, you would learn classical Chinese medicine from a lineage. You would mm -hmm. learn from a teacher. It would be grandfathered in, and you would have to study with that person um, and go with them and see how they would treat patients. And each teacher, each master of their lineage would treat patients differently, would use a little bit of different herbs, would tweak the Shang Han Lun uh, formulas in their own different ways. And when Mao came into power, he essentially standardized mm. classical Chinese medicine into TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, which is what we have today, so that there could be the standardized patented formulas that could be very widely prescribed. And it became a little bit more of an allopathic model. The original Chinese medicine didn't even have organ meridians, which is interesting. Wow. Yeah. it's yeah. I just took a course in classical Chinese medicine, the Jingfang lineage, and I was amazed to see how different it is from what we have today. And I didn't know that about the history. So, so many of these things where there was nuance and customization for individuals in medicine systems changed and became industrialized. And we don't realize that the same thing also happened to our food because all of this is happening behind the scenes. Yeah. So if you could maybe start by sharing a little bit of what you learned from Michael Pollan about that industrialization process, what is the history of all that? Yeah. So it... It really started on a large scale um, right after the war because we were we were really concerned about food being cheap, fast, and accessible. So we started um, plowing the fields really aggressively. And also around that time, we started using pesticides and herbicides mm -hmm. because it went from fighting the enemy on land or, um, you know, and overseas to then fighting this new enemy on the land, which was pests, right, for the food. Yeah. So it started with that. And I think, I think it really started with good intention, you know, and this is around the time when we started paying subsidies to farmers because this is how we created m large mass amounts of food for cheaper because we were paying these farmers to grow crops like corn, wheat, 
and soy. Mm -hmm. Also, when you think about it, around the same time, we had women going back into the workforce. So women were looking for a faster way to get food on the table for their family at night after having worked all day. So then we started creating these really cheap, highly processed, convenient foods. Mm -hmm. Then there was a really famous study that came out in the 1970s with Harvard. And NPR actually reported on this, and they have the actual interactions of, of what went down. But basically, they found that it was sugar that was contributing to heart disease. Mm -hmm. So, But the sugar industry got wind of that. They pay these Harvard scientists off to say that it was fat. This cued the whole low-fat movement. And so you look at all of these things are happening all at once. So we're creating these hyper-processed foods. We're trying to make them cheaper, and we're using a lot of foods like corn, wheat, and soy. Mm -hmm. So it's showing up in everything. I mean, you look at the back of a, a packaged processed food, and almost every single one of them says contains corn, wheat, and soy. Yes. That's because we have an overabundance of it, and we need a place to put it. So we're putting it in all these packaged foods. Mm -hmm. And then we replaced fat with sugar. Yeah. And so everything is being loaded with sugar now. And so it's we are we we traded these whole real foods for convenience and that's what's really hurting us and i'm sure it's because traditionally a lot of even even if you look at your ancestors dishes your family dishes a lot of them i'm sure traditionally were made with more saturated fats animal lards yes. or if for example, you are from the Philippines, perhaps coconut oil and these fats that are solid at room temperature and that were a little bit more of a hassle to get and store and safe and save and keep from oxidizing yeah and that's what made food taste really good. All of our traditional recipes from grandma that we love, they're they are rich in those nutrient-dense fats. And then when you switch over to mass-producing packaged food, you still need it to taste really good so that people want it. Yes. And so, of course, you're going to lower that fat intake and increase the sugar to make it taste fabulous. However, I do think that just like the low-fat movement demonized fat, I do always – um, try to shy away from also demonizing sugar at the same time. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, it's funny. I, I thought I had a sugar addiction. Have you ever thought you had one? <laughs> I actually really did have one and I can show my, tell my story, but yeah. Well, I thought but I had a sugar addiction and someone messaged me and was like, if you really have a sugar addiction, would you sit there and would you eat a bowl of white sugar? And I was like, wait, no. And she was like, well, doesn't that tell you something? It's not the sugar. It's the hyper palatable foods. It's the combination of sugar, fat, salt, and flavor in these packaged, really calorie, energy dense foods when our bodies are like, oh my God, I'll take more of that. I'll store it for the winter. It's so good. My brain is lighting up that the addiction essentially comes from. Um, so I've, from what I've seen in the science, an overconsumption of those foods or an overconsumption of, of calorie intake, essentially, whether it's from fats and especially poor quality fats or sugar is going to create these metabolic derangements and heart disease and all of those things. Yeah, absolutely. And there's always nuance with that. But I do think there is something to be said when almost every product you pull off the shelf right now has sugar in it yeah. in places that it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Salad dressing, soups. Like, why are we adding sugar to that? Yeah. And then when you look at if someone's just eating a standard American diet, they can easily eat like 90 grams of sugar in one day without even eating dessert. Yeah. And that's what's scary about it. So I do think I, I agree with what you said, but then there's also that nuance there that we do need to recognize that the majority, I think it's at 65% of our calories now are coming from these hyper-processed foods. Yes. And that is, so you're right, that is a bigger issue, but part of the issue of these hyper-processed foods is if you're not aware of it and reading labels, you can very easily take down way much more sugar than what you need. And your body needs that sugar, yes, for glucose to create ATP so that you have energy, of course. Yeah. But we know with a surplus of that, it's yes. going to be stored as fat. Yeah, for sure. And I think I almost see it as the the high sugar content that we're seeing on labels of things like salad dressing and all of these things. Yeah. It's this, to me, it's more of this symptom of the rise of hyper palatable foods than yes. it is from the plain old overconsumption of sugar or carbs. I think there's definitely an overconsumption of energy intake of calories in this country yeah. because our foods are so processed. So we can eat a lot of cookies in one sitting and not realize how much we're consuming or we can eat a lot of salad dressing because it's so good and there's the sugar in there that's lighting up our brains. But it's not necessarily, let's say, the the sugar that's the issue. But yes, it's a sign of yes. this hyper palatable processed, hyper processed foods that have taken over our food supply due to that convenience factor. Yeah. And that's hard because a lot of people are reaching for the convenient foods because they are working two, three jobs and they're trying to just be their family, something that tastes good. And we've come into this place where we think that we're doing ourselves a service by grabbing something that's cheap and easy, but we're paying for it in other ways, right? Yes. Yes. And I think the really important thing to take away from this is that 
because for me, I'm empowered by knowing this because I don't want to be tricked by these foods. These foods are created to be overeaten. Yes. Yes. You know, they have flavor scientists that work for these food companies that create what's called the food bliss point. It's like the Goldilocks mm -hmm. of the of the taste where it's that perfect taste of salt, sweet and fat yes. that makes you just, I mean, we all know that feeling, right? Of like opening a bag of Doritos, Pringles. Yeah. Once you pop, you can't stop. I mean, that's so real. And so it, this is where I like to remind the listener that it's not your fault. This is literally overriding our own bodies. Yes. Bio biology. Yeah. You know, no one's binging on salmon because you have that ratio of protein and fat that keeps you full and satisfied. And your body is also signaling the ghrelin and the leptin, like the hormones that actually help you to be satisfied and signal to your body when you're full. Yeah. But these food like products are overriding all of those signals. And so we almost feel like we we're being over, you know, overridden. But yeah. yeah, I think that's such a good point, the leptin and the ghrelin. Because yeah. for me, I when I thought I had the sugar addiction and I was like, okay, I'm going to cut out sugar. And then I realized, oh, wait, it's actually the processing, the hyper palatableness of it all. It's when I'm combining the sugar with yeah. the fat and the flavor in a convenient cookie. That's what's lighting up my pleasure centers. I did a two month experiment where I did no hyper palatable foods. I just ate mostly whole foods and made sure that I wasn't eating things in a particular combination to make them as delicious as possible. I was eating a sweet potato until I was full on sweet potato and some chicken until I was full on chicken. I love that. And my leptin levels completely reset. I used to be hungry in the middle of the night because my leptin was so dysregulated. And it completely just changed my appetite and really helped me to stop binge eating. I had a huge binge eating issue because of leptin dysregulation and also weight loss resistance because of my leptin issues. And we don't realize that these packaged foods have a hormonal effect. You know, it really yeah. does change our satiety signals, our appetite hormones. Um, and so it's not a... It's not an all packaged foods are bad for you at all times kind of thing. It's just an awareness of these packaged foods will change the way that you perceive the rest of really good food, normal food, and will change your hormones. And so can we eat more real food? Yeah. Real foodology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was the whole basis of real foodology, obviously, is because I was looking around at, and, and just learning all this and saying, we're eating too many things in packages. Let's get back to eating real food. We're not yes. eating enough real food anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it can be hard because you're out here trying to teach people how to read these package labels and you're having to scrutinize things because there are ingredients that you can see are upping the sugar level or upping yes. the brain pleasure level. And then people are like, oh, well, is everything bad for me? And the honest answer is that no, but there's just nothing that's ever going to replace cooking at home and eating real food from scratch as much as possible. That will yes. never compare to a packaged food. So we could go in the grocery store and pick apart these packaged foods all day and we'll probably always find something wrong with them because real food is where it's at. Exactly. And just having little tips and tricks. One thing I tell people, because I'm a realist, I'm not going to sit here and say, eat only whole real foods, only shop at the farmer's market. Yeah. Like it, most people, that's not their reality. And it's also not feasible or accessible. Yeah. So when you're buying pro or when you're buying packaged foods, if you could technically buy all those ingredients at the grocery store and mm -hmm. make that at home, then that that is a package that I would say that's fair game to buy. Where we're starting to get into issues is when you look at an ingredient and you're like, where in the world would I find polysorbate 80? Yeah. You know, like I'm not buying that in the grocery store. And so, and thank God we live in a time where there are companies that are creating more of these products that just have a few simple ingredients and they're becoming more accessible and they're becoming more affordable. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what I appreciate so much is that you're always on the hunt for these simple ingredient, few ingredient crackers or cookies or things like that, where these companies are actually trying to do their best. And they're yeah. trying to give us the the realest food possible in a package because, of course, we want cookies. Of course, yeah. we're, we're not going to bake them all the time. I try to. I'm not that good at it, but... <laughs> I try. <laughs> I bet you're better than you think. <laughs> I'm starting to get better. It's actually a – you have like a curve with it. You yeah. start cooking at home and you realize you really suck. Yeah, and you're yeah, like, yeah. oh, no, I'm just going to order in the food. I give up. This is terrible. I can't believe my husband has to eat this now for the next two days. And then you keep going and you start to get better at it. And it becomes this labor of love where you become really present with the food and you appreciate so much more what you're eating and you eat more mindfully. And it's 
it's really about our relationship with food. And obviously not everyone has the luxury to slow down and be able to cook every meal or meal prep. But when you can, it it's really part of wellness. It's a way to take care of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And you're investing in your health because when you eat better, you think clearer, you um, look better, you feel better in your body. You probably show up better to your work. Mm -hmm. So maybe you'll get a promotion and make more money. That's part of my message too is like – the more we can focus on these nutritious foods and really just try as much as we can to get as healthy as we can, we're going to feel better and we're going to show up better in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So as these companies took over and started to make these hyper palatable, packaged, easy, convenient foods and sold them to us as, hey, you can now go out and make more money because we'll do the food part for you, which is so sinister in a sense. You know, it's, it's, so it's part of this like late stage capitalism that we're in mm -hmm. really of like, well, everyone should just be out of the house and work, outsource everything, including these foods. It's, it's really sad. Um, we've come to the point where you told me that most of our food system is owned by the same 11 companies, is yeah. it? Can you yeah. tell us about that? Yeah. So there's 11 companies that own the entirety of our food system. And some of them are um, – like one of them is Procter & Gamble. Mm -hmm. They're also creating chemicals, but they own food companies as well. And this is – yeah, I mean, like you said, this is our uh, the late-stage capitalism that we're experiencing right now because we're at a point now where these food companies have so much money – yeah. And they are fighting to the death to stay on top, even though all these – I mean, there's all these studies coming out right now, and there's all these statistics coming out about the health of our country. I mean, by 2030, they're projecting that 49.6% of Americans are going to have at least one chronic disease. That's half of our population. <laughs> And that's crazy. And so, in, look, it, it looks grim. We, we have the power. We can take our power back yeah. with everything that we're talking about today. And that's, you know, a lot of my messages, I really try to keep it positive. But we do have to look at the realities so that we know what we're up against. And I tell people, if you can and if you can budget it, put your money into these corporations that are doing right by our health. Because unfortunately, what's happening right now, there's this misconception that if it's on the shelf, it's been um, vetted for and that it's completely healthy. I think everyone believes that the FDA, the USDA, these governing bodies are regulating more than they actually are. Mm -hmm. There is a concept called GROSS or generally recognized as safe. Mm -hmm. The companies themselves are the ones that were, are required to give the paperwork to the FDA in order to prove if a new ingredient that they want to use is generally recognized as safe. To me, I see that as why are we, are we putting things in our food that we're like, oh, like generally we think it's like probably safe. And that's what's happening is that we're putting these foods into our food system without actually really being like, okay, we know these are good and healthy because then the mentality is like, oh, we'll figure it out as we go and then we'll just pull them off the shelf later. Yeah. But also a lot of these products are not being pulled off the shelf, even though time and time again, all these studies are coming out showing that these certain ingredients are actually really having an effect on our bodies, like all these preservatives and emulsifiers and everything else, else that's in there. And there's also a revolving door that's happening right now between the USDA, the FDA. You'll see someone who's um, like a you know a top executive at the USDA, and then four years later he's working at you know at Big Pharma in a Big Pharma mm -hmm. company. Or Didn't this happen with Monsanto? There was a guy who was working for the FDA, and then he went over to Monsanto, or vice versa. Yeah, I think it. Uh, he went over to the FDA because Monsanto actually was now they were bought by Bayer mm -hmm. because Monsanto, which we'll get into, they're yeah. the creators of Roundup, which is glyphosate, and they. Uh, jump ship and sold to Bayer because they were going downhill because all this stuff was coming out about cancer mm -hmm. and the link to glyphosate. But yeah, I mean, there's a, I think by now a lot of people are starting to really wake up to just the deep corrup corruption that's happening in America. Mm -hmm. And it's happening in every industry. I mean, you look at the food industry and, but food is what we'll focus on. Um, this is the problem is that there also, we have lobbyists in Washington Yes. That Can are you explain paying. what lobbying is? Because this is the craziest concept to me. I feel like it's bribery. It is. It's bribery. It's legal bribery. There's all these loopholes and how they get around it. But essentially what's happening is these um, – all of these big food corporations have different industries and different lobbyists. So like, for example, let's say someone from like the sugar industry will have like a, a representative. They'll go to Washington. They'll make, you know, good with some of the politicians that are maybe either, either people in Congress or certain politicians that are voting on um, certain regulations that – that will affect determine, their product. Yes, exactly. That will determine how we guide Americans to um, to eat. So there's a 
guidelines that come out, I believe they come out every four years, but we should look out, look up exactly, from the USDA. And they're paying to get certain guidelines into this curriculum to say like, oh, eat a certain percentage of grains or um, Coca-Cola is actually not that bad for you. Or they'll just say, you know, like soda consumption is actually not that bad for you and mm -hmm. it's not contributing to obesity. Mm -hmm. And the problem is a lot of these politicians they have no background in nutrition. They don't really know. And they're also getting paid. And they're also, a lot of them are saying like, okay, if you help me pass this bill, then I'll help you pass this bill. So mm -hmm. everyone's kind of scratching each other's backs. They're making money off of each other. And these large corporations that have vested interest in these certain guidelines going a certain way, they're paying for that. Yeah. But it's happening legally because it's happening lobbying and like under the table. Yeah. And like you said, we, we look at something on a shelf and we think, well, it wouldn't if it was that bad, it wouldn't be there. Yeah. And even as you're talking when you were mentioning soda, I just started thinking, yeah, it is kind of strange that soda consumption is so normal to us because we know that it is, again, not that I think all sugar is bad. I have sugar in my diet in the context of protein, fat, fiber, all the things. But we know that just drinking a, like an injection of liquid carbohydrates that is not within a food matrix that contains vitamins, minerals, fiber, and all of that, yeah. is not going to be the best for our blood sugar regulation and is thus going to create inflammation, metabolic derangement, et cetera. So we know that that's bad. There's no one that I would think would say soda is nutritious. So then I thought, why is it so normalized to consume soda? And it's because you walk in every grocery store and it is everywhere. Yeah. So to us, it is so normalized and it's like, well, it wouldn't be there if it was really that bad for me and we can almost turn a blind eye to it and say, yes. well, they're they're giving it to us right here. It's just part of the American life. It's something that I love. It's really delicious and hyper palatable and makes my brain happy and I'm not going to stop. Yes. We're kind of set up for failure. We are. And um, I wish I could remember this stat, but there's a, a guy who I've had on my podcast, Callie Means, and he used to work for... Um, a group that was uh, a part of advertising for Coca-Cola like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so he sat in on all these conversations. And there's a statistic that he dropped about uh, what's really sad, what's happening right now with food stamps, is that the majority of spending on these like Coca-Cola products mm -hmm. are actually through people that are on food stamps. Because there's some sort of like incentive. I wish I could remember exactly what his statistic was. But like you said, we're setting people up for failure. And you look at people that are really dealing with accessibility issues, mm -hmm. are unable to put food on their table, but then they're given, you know, government assistance. And this government assistance is basically like encouraging them yeah, to perhaps buy the Coca-Cola. Yeah, perhaps a little farther when it's to those sorts of products. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think it's like they have like an incentive to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's because, again, these corporations like Coca-Cola, they want people to consume them as much as possible. Yeah. It's about money. It's all about It's a money. food system that's for profit. And not to say, I mean, I love a good old free market. I love a good old capitalistic yeah, market that encourages innovation. That's great. That means that this guy is going to try to do that product better than this guy, and we're going to get the best product. We love, love the that. premise of it. But the late stage capitalism that we're in now, where it's like, how can we squeeze every single dollar? out of the American public who's already struggling and get them to spend as much as possible on our products that we know in good conscience are not nutritious. That's yeah. where you you step back and you're like, what what kind of worlds are we living in? This is, it's wild. It is, it's really sad. There needs to be a, a checks and balance happening here because no one is holding these large corporations they're, they're not holding them accountable. Yeah. And then you look at, too, another thing that's happening is there was actually a really famous study that came out from Coca-Cola um, I want to say it was around like 2017, they paid for this study to say that there was no link to obesity and consumption of sodas. Mm -hmm. They paid for this study. Mm -hmm. And this is happening all the time. So I want to tell people to be very careful about where you're getting your information from. Studies are required to disclose if there's any sort of funding being involved. And you always want to read the fine print and see who's actually involved in that study because a lot of these corporations are paying for the data to be skewed in order to sway the general public. Mm -hmm. And I will say there's nuance there. If someone is just drinking soda or they're eating 500 calories of food and the rest of their calories are soda and they're still within their energy balance, you probably will not get obese from drinking soda. But that's mm -hmm. not the reality of the way that Americans are eating. The soda is an add-on for us. We're not necessarily considering it in our energy and caloric balance. Yes. And so I'm sure that they use that kind of a loophole to get around it because people, I mean, my dad lost 100 pounds once eating Wendy's. You know, people can, <laughs> it can happen because calories in, calories out yeah. are a thing. But at the same time, do you want to be spending 
your energy intake on something that has no nutritional value and is going to derange your blood sugar? No, but there's not education there. Coca-Cola is not putting education out there on blood sugar balance and hormone health and all of this. They're no. just trying to sell a product and it's scary. And so they can skew the science and maybe that study was factually correct because of the way they designed it. But it yeah. doesn't mean that it's nutritious, good food. It just means that in this one context, it wasn't all that bad. Now everything, everything's fine. Exactly. It's They twist it. And a lot of science is twisted. And that's that's the part where I, like you, love science. You wanted yes. to get a degree where you could understand science. You could take a statistics cl class. You could learn how to see if uh, there was a design flaw, if something was statistically significant. That's amazing. And I want to rely on the science, but so much of it is bought and paid for and designed in a way that favors the companies. Yeah. And we're not looking at that. And it's it's scary. It's scary because we want to think that science is absolute, but it's not when it's designed by these multi-billion dollar corporations. Exactly. Again, they have so much money. Yeah. And they're spending it on the studies, lobbying, yep. politicians. Yeah. Advertisements. And when they're lobbying, is it that they're essentially donating money to a politician's campaign yes. to get them to vote on a law? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So they'll usually donate to their campaign. And that's usually and that's how that's like the loophole. That's what lobbying would be considered. It's just it's just yeah, like sorry, we're profit. I mean, it's like yeah. we're, we're like pawns for profit. It's really yeah. it's wild. So that's where, you know, your message comes in of let's take all of these decisions into our own hands. Let's really think about our choices because they're not thinking of us. They're thinking of dollars. Yeah. And let's look beyond just the science that they're producing and listen to our bodies and how we're feeling and look at the science of other things like blood sugar balance. When you look at the science of blood sugar balance, does it make sense to drink a, a soda that you can drink in five seconds that's 46 grams of sugar? No, because it's going to hit your bloodstream too fast and cause inflammation. Yeah. But when you look at it through their study of a perfectly designed caloric <laughs> exactly. intake, it's not. It's like it's it's infuriating. It's yeah. infuriating to someone who wants science to be there. Me too. Because <sighs> then it starts to feel like where can you trust the science? And you have to essentially take a class on how to read a study and know what is shoddy science and what what is actually real and legit. And mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that brings me to glyphosate because the science on GMOs also seems to be, quote, settled. And they are, quote, safe for human consumption. And I know people in real life who study agricultural science and are brilliant and they're like why are you against GMOs and and we argue about it and they think I'm crazy because I don't believe that that science is sound and I think that it'll come out years and years from now that corn that produces its own intrinsic BT toxin and makes bug stomachs explode is not safe for our stomachs it's just that's more my logic right that's not science I don't have a study that says that I just don't feel that's safe for us so can you talk about GMO crops as one point, and then why glyphosate is necessary to support those GMO crops because they're two different issues. Yeah, and I'll start out by saying so. There, I see a com I see comments about this all the time, and people are like, "We've been genetically modifying food forever." They are um, not understanding that that's something different. That's something called hybridization. Yes, crossbreeding. Hybrid exactly. So we've been hybridizing crops, yes, for a very long time. Yep. And I consider that to be totally fine, safe. Like that is a really ancient practice that we've done for a long time. Mm -hmm. Genetically modifying, we have only been doing that since I believe it was about the 70s is mm -hmm. when we started. And that's where you're taking a gene. Um, for example, they took a gene from a jellyfish and placed it into an apple to make it not brown. And that's where you're actually messing with the genetic composition of the actual plant. Now, that alone to me scares me a little bit because what I've read is that it changes the protein component of it. Uh -huh. And we don't really know exactly what that's doing to our bodies. So I'm not saying necessarily – I'm not saying – that I know that that's bad for us. I'm just saying, like you said, I'm concerned that we're going to go down the line and we're going to go, ooh, that was actually not really that great for us. Same with smoking. Same with all these other things that we thought exactly. were really good. It's just, it's healthy to question. Exactly. We should always be questioning these things. Yeah. Now, another thing was they, when they were starting to genetically modify these crops, the big message that we were getting was, this is going to be great. We're going to use less pesticides and less herbicides. I hear this all the time from people. They're like, no, 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 GMOs use less. This is so not true. With genetically modifying, you have to use more pesticides. And we are, the stats show we're using more and more and more pesticides as the years go on. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned something called Roundup Ready corn, where they actually have the BT toxin 
in the corn. So scientists, what they realized when they started spraying the crops with something, for example, like glyphosate, they were realizing that it was killing everything. And they wanted these crops to withstand spraying the glyphosate so that it killed everything else around it. But then you had these beautiful corn crops that were growing in the midst of all the death. And just to take it back for a second, glyphosate is a sprayable herbicide yes. and pesticide. It's yes. an herbicide and a pesticide, right? It's it's meant to kill weeds yes. and also will kill pests. Yes. And so originally they created this super strong, out of this world, roundup, essentially roundup glyphosate, sprayable pesticide that they could use to make sure that their crops, the corn and soy that they wanted to grow in monstrous amounts were safe from pests. But like you said, they found out that it was killing everything because it was yeah. so strong. And it's also think about that. It's not only going to kill the pests, it's going to kill the good bacteria and the yes. microbes in the soil that take nutrients from the rocks in the soil and put minerals in the plants. Like that's part of the whole ecosystem. But just so yes. that people have the context of what glyphosate is, it is a pesticide and it was too strong. So because of that. Yeah. So because of that, they went back in the lab and they figured out how to add glyphosate actually into the seed of the corn itself. Mm -hmm. And also great big bonus for Monsanto because now they could patent something because you can't patent live plants and mm -hmm. animals. But since they added this BT toxin in there, now they have this amazing wonder seed that they can patent and they can charge farmers more for it. Exactly. And which is really, farmers have to essentially be loyal to just the Monsanto patented seed and just the Monsanto corn and have to just monocrop corn because they can no longer afford to have the diversity and their soil is ruined. So Again, I want to break it down as much as possible because you and I are really familiar with the topic, but I think there's a lot of confusion out there about yeah. GMOs because of, like you said, this concept of crossbreeding. We have, for example, cotton candy grapes in the grocery store, right? Mm -hmm. Someone took a grape and crossbred it with another species, like a green grape, crossbred it with another species of grape and made a really sweet cotton candy-ish tasting grape. That's not a genetically modified food. That's no. just being creative with the breeding of plants, right? Exactly. Same with wheat. Wheat used to be a really small plant. And then over the years, we crossbred it, what is it, like 76 times to get to the wheat yeah. that we have today that's really tall and has a higher yield and all of this. Wheat is not GMO. It's just crossbred. So there's only a handful of crops. It's corn, yep. soy, wheat. beets. Oh, is it wheat now? Uh, oh, no, it's not. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. It's corn, soybeans, papaya, Beets. Beets. Because they do sugar yes, from beets. Yes, the sugar. And canola is also a genetically yes. modified crop. So it's yes. really those big five. Yeah. Those are the only crops you need to worry about being genetically modified. There's no genetically modified apples. There's no genetically modified anything else. When we're talking about GMOs, we mean those five foods. And you might think, well, I don't really eat soybeans, you know, or I don't really eat, I don't have corn on the cob a lot. But because through the industrialization of food, they subsidized farmers to grow massive amounts of genetically modified corn and soy, they are now putting corn flour, corn syrup, soy protein isolate, soy whatever, in most packaged and processed foods. So we are all eating a little dose of it when we're choosing conventional packaged and processed foods. So I just yeah. want to make that clear because it's those five. And I think people get confused by labels because they want to go find something that's non-GMO verified and has that stamp on it. Yeah. But it doesn't, if you're getting crackers that are non-GMO project verified, but they don't have any corn or soy in them or beets or whatever, it doesn't mean anything. It's just kind of greenwashing. Yeah, I'm trying to think of where that would come into play if it's crackers with a non-GMO verification. Because if it doesn't have one of those crops in there, yeah. But I mean, even sure for I've my products that. and my product line, I, you know, I make herbal tinctures and I, I don't use corn or soy ever. But people will ask, are you non-GMO project verified? Because people now have heard the term non-GMO and fine. it's become a buzzword and it's become profitable and marketable. Yeah. And they just want to know that there's not the GMOs in it. And of course there's not, but it, it's it's interesting that we're looking for them where they're not because it's a whole different issue. So it's those five crops. Yeah. And the problem with corn specifically, which is like, to me the biggest offender, is mm -hmm. that they have the Roundup Ready corn that actually does produce BT toxin within the kernel. Yes. And they did this so that when the bugs would nibble on the kernels in the field, the bugs would ingest the toxin already built into the plant and their stomachs would explode. I know. And when I heard that, I was like, why did we ever think it was okay for us to consume? And I, I mean, I'm not sure if they've done human studies on this to see if we've had the same GI irritation. I haven't looked. I will look I after this. I think that we have. I did watch Genetic Roulette once. Have you ever seen that documentary? No. So this is my problem. I talked to so many people and no one has seen it. 
This was like fringe conspiracy theory me in 2013. <laughs> Love it. I, w- I had gone and studied abroad and I was like, why the heck do I not have IBS in U- the UK? What do you mean? I can just go there and be fine? And then I came home and my stomach was a mess again and I was depressed and all these things. And so I found this documentary called Genetic Roulette where I first learned about this BT toxin built into corn exploding bugs and my mind was blown. And in that documentary, which I can't find anywhere, if I can find it, I'll link it. They had a study on pigs where they looked at pigs and did autopsies on them and they found that their stomachs were like bright red, bright pink from all the GI irritation. irritation. But I don't, when people say GMOs are safe, they don't reference that study. So I'm going to have to do some digging to find this. But if you can, that documentary is amazing. I'll have to check that out. And it just doesn't make sense. There is also a concern because there was a French study that came out in, I believe it was around, I'm trying to think of when that would have been, 2012 or 13, Mm -hmm. that found that um, GMOs, so they were feeding GMOs to rats and they were getting these massive tumors that were growing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And they actually got the um, – so the study was actually devoid. They they came back and they pulled, they retracted it. Yes. But then they brought it back because they actually found out that it was true. I there think was, this is in the documentary. I think this is in Genetic yeah. Roulette. And that's one thing that's really concerning. And you know what's interesting is that to my knowledge, I'm not sure anyone has done a study like that again because that scientist got drugged through the mud. Yes. And yes. they retracted People, Scientists his... are afraid to question it. Exactly. And so they, and they retracted it. But I think this is so important to know that they found it to be valid and they actually reinstated it years mm-hmm. later. Mm-hmm. But it did a lot of damage because everyone started saying, oh, no, that's like shoddy science. But no, it was actually factual. Yeah. And that is a really big concern, especially when you look at rising rates of cancer in this country. And so many people are unknowingly eating these genetically modified foods. And there was a time when we were fighting so hard to just get them labeled. Yeah. And they're sort of labeled now, but you have to read the really fine print under the ingredients and it will say contains bioengineered ingredients. That means that it has genetically modified either corn, soy, one of the products that we mentioned. Also, another thing to note Um, that is concerning. The majority of the corn that we grow in this country is actually going back to livestock feed. Yes. So if you're eating conventional meat, which I'm not saying don't ever do it, but if you can be more conscientious of buying organic meat, that's ensuring that the cows that you're eating, well, any of the the meat that you're eating, they were not fed genetically modified feed. Yes. And even if that's not, because I don't know how much that translates into, okay, does the meat become unhealthy? Does the actual animal suffer? And thus the meat that we're eating is not as healthy. Maybe there's a, an argument to be made there that it's not that bad. But I think the the true thing here is that you're simply not supporting the yes. sale of the genetically modified corn to the factory farms that are then 100%. using it to feed the cows because we just want to stop giving our money to – and then what the hard part there too is that all of these farmers in the middle of the country are having to grow genetically modified corn. So when we're then taking our dollars away from – GMOs, we're then taking our dollars away from these hardworking farmers that are just trying to do their best and now have to use Monsanto crops because the farm next to them uses it anyway and the glyphosates and the exactly. water runoff and it's affecting their crops. So it's hard because so many farmers have now been pulled into the to, into big ag, into agricultural science. They're teaching it in all the colleges when you study agricultural yeah. science that GMOs are the way to go. And these well-meaning folks really believe that it's it's good and it's feeding the world because that's another argument that since we can grow more of the GMO crops because we can monocrop them in these huge fields and take away any pest you could possibly see, we can feed the world. But the world is still hungry. Exactly. And we are more under – we are overfed and undernourished. Yeah. Yeah, you're not going to get nourishment from corn and soy. Exactly. So why is that what we're wanting? Even if we can enrich it, even if we can genetically modify rice to have vitamin A, which is something that I've seen that they're trying to do. Yeah. Why can't we deliver? Why can't we? The government has so much money. Why can't we subsidize the delivery of vitamin A supplements into areas of the world where we know that this is an issue or vitamin B supplements into parts of the world where we know that beriberi is an issue? I mean, this is really, it's like, let's think backwards for a second. Let's not try to genetically splice the crops and like take away people's food diversity to get vitamins into one food that we now have the patent of and can sell. Let's go give them the vitamins and mineral. It's, I know it's crazy. Again, it comes back to all for profit. I will say though, 
I have been having so many conversations with farmers on my podcast recently, and I've been watching a ton of documentaries because I'm really getting into regenerative farming. Wow. A lot of farmers are realizing that this system is broken. And I don't want to speak for every farmer because I know some of them are, are you know, still in the genetically modified and Monsanto glyphosate route. But there is this movement happening right now because they're realizing that this feed the world concept, one, is never going to be feasible if we are killing the entire ecosystem of the soil. And also when you look at regenerative farming, which I'm going to explain in a second, versus what we're doing right now with industrialized agriculture, we are completely decimating the land. We're tilling it. We're destroying the topsoil. We're spraying yes. it like crazy with glyphosate, which you mentioned earlier, is killing all of the good minerals, it's killing the good bacteria in the soil. Yeah, soil's and alive, like exactly. our guts. Exactly. Yeah. And we are only as healthy as the soil is because think about those plants are getting all those nutrients from the soil, but if the soil's dead, the plants are not getting nutrients. Mm -hmm. And then we're supposed to be getting these nutrients from the plants. Yeah. And when you when you have a healthy ecosystem in the soil like that and you work with nature instead of against her by just killing and tilling and spraying, when you're working with nature, a beautiful Thing happens where it pulls carbon out of the atmosphere. And mm. what is one of the biggest things that we're dealing with right now? Climate change and too much carbon. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Because carbon is actually food for the plants. Yeah. And so you want it to be in the soil. And when you allow nature to do her thing and do this natural way of what we should be doing with farming, the carbon is going to be pulled naturally into the soil and it's going to be out of the atmosphere. I love that so much. And I want you guys to know, I, I definitely want you to explain regenerative farming, what that is, how we can support that and buy companies, buy from companies that are doing that. And I promise you guys who are listening, we're going to get into the solutions in a moment. Yeah. But I just kind of want to keep nerding out about this because you're saying things like topsoil and you're saying things like monocropping. And I think that once folks learn the meaning of those terms and what that looks like in real life and what's happening to our earth and how earthworms and bacteria are needed, People get jazzed up. I'm jazzed up about I'm this, so you know, and like up. I want people are going to want to take action when they understand what's happening. So let's break down just a little bit further the other downstream effects of genetically modified crops and GMOs. So one issue that you just mentioned is monocropping. Yeah. It's basically the question of what is the cost of high yield, right? High yield means that you have this huge solo crop of just corn, right? It's, it's like the entire farmer's land is dedicated to corn. Yeah which means you don't have any biodiversity. You don't have any helper plants, symbiotic plants that actually naturally fight pests or take different minerals from the soil or put other things back into the soil. You have just corn and it's just taking the same things from the soil over and over again and the land is never resting, right? Yes. Tell us never. more about this whole phenomenon. Yeah. So what you were just saying is that it, we see it commonly with like soybeans and corn where you just see the rows and rows and you don't see a single other plant but that one plant. Mm -hmm. And what you just mentioned, um, what you want is a biodiversity of different plants. So I actually just watched a documentary all about this called Common Ground. I highly recommend everyone watch it. It's coming out soon on Netflix. <sighs> And what they were talking about is you want this biodiversity of plants because they all play different roles. So some, like you said, they have this symbiotic relationship with the other plants. Some of them ward off pests. Some of them provide cover for mm -hmm. the crops. Mm -hmm. Because what happens a lot of times in these farmlands is they'll get crazy high winds or they'll get this crazy flooding or um, hail or whatever. And if you just have those monocrop crops, so we actually watched this in the documentary where um, a guy has a regenerative farm in the next door, his uh, neighbor's farm got completely washed away. There was not a single crop left on his land. And you literally saw the line down the middle where on the one side, there was not a single plant. Why? Because, so he had this massive storm come through and it just blew the entire top layer off. So all the plants went and then there was flooding and it just pushed all the soil. And he showed us the comparison of like his grass was here their soil, and this was on their line of property, and the soil was like down here, and he had beautiful green pastures, he had all these different cover crops, and he was explaining that, he was pointing out, he was like, you see this line of plants right here, those are my cover crops that are protecting the other plants that are growing right now. And so it's this beautiful symbiosis that happens in nature. And this is why whenever we try to play God and we mess with things, yeah. Nature always finds a way. I know. We always think we can do it better. <laughs> it's so funny. It's so funny, right? And whether your God is nature or whatever. Exactly. Like Universe. Like yeah. It's even if you look at God as nature, nature just knows how to do it. There's there's a reason why even you look at a forest or you look at once you stop spraying a pest, what ends up growing in your yard instead yeah. of just 
grass, you look at all the different crops and how they're working, not crops, but weeds, quote unquote, and how they're working together and how they're interplaying. And they just naturally know how to complement one another. Exactly. Just like human communities. It, we really mirror the soil and biodiversity. Nobody wants a community of people that are homogenous and all the same. Exactly. Then we do not protect each other. We do not learn from one another. We don't keep each other in check. Yeah. And the same goes for plants in the soil. And also with monocropping, if something happens like a storm or something happens like a really crappy season where corn might be affected by the temperature, but some other crops that you were going to grow wouldn't have been affected by the temperature, yes. that farmer loses their entire income, their entire yield of that season because they put all their eggs in one basket. So it doesn't economically make sense either. No, it doesn't. In fact, this farmer that now is growing regeneratively, the reason he got into that is because for three years in a row, he kept having storms come through and completely wipe out his land because he was initially growing conventionally with genetically modified crops and glyphosate and all this stuff. And on the third year, he was like, I have to do something different because he's like, I'm not making any money. I'm losing. He lost 100% of his yield. Whoa. And this is what I was saying earlier with the, a lot of farmers are starting to wake up that this system that we're in right now is broken. Mm -hmm. We're actually not even helping the farmers either. Yeah. You know, the farmers are in debt. They're having a hard time keeping their yields because uh, we didn't even talk about this. But similarly to what's happening with antibiotic resistance, yeah. we're also having weed resistance, glyphosate resistance, because, again, Nature's nature fight always <laughs> fights back. So yeah. nature's like, oh, OK, well, we're going to find a way to grow other plants around here, you know, yeah. and they're growing these super weeds that now we can't get rid of. Wow. Wow. I mean, it's I'm almost happy for nature when I hear that, but I'm not happy for the farmers who are having to deal with super weeds, nor am I happy for what those super weeds might do to the rest of our, you know, diverse fauna and flora. So yeah. that's wild. Um, and then obviously there is the issue of the the topsoil. So can you tell us what topsoil is? Yeah, so it's the obviously the very it's exactly how it sounds is it's the very top layer of the soil. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing right now in conventional farming, tilling, you're ripping up all of that topsoil right under um if if I'm understanding correctly from what I've learned, there's all these little uh, what do you call it? It's all the roots from the plants and they're in this network together. Mm -hmm. And when you till, you break all of that up and you're breaking up that kind of glue mm -hmm. to the soil. Mm -hmm. And that's what keeps all the plants up in there. But when we're just doing these general tilling practices, we're breaking off that top layer of the soil. It's actually really imperative for the overall ecosystem. Wow. So it's just a layer that you're messing with the ecosystem that should not be messed with. So that's why you'll see at farmer's markets, a lot of stands will say hand tilled or no yes. till. They'll yes. say no till farming. Yeah. Because because when you're tilling like that and you're messing with that ecosystem, it actually messes with the process that helps with that carbon sequestration to bring the carbon back down. Huh. I mean, it's the same. It's just everything is such a parallel. My brain always makes these connections. I think of how even with herbalism, um, you know, I, I look at how companies are taking one singular compound in a plant and standardizing it and putting it out there in a product. Like they're taking just curcumin from turmeric, yes. which has benefits. Great. Yeah. But in traditional herbalism, in our practice, you're going to get a lot more out of the full spectrum of the plant and all of the hundred, maybe thousand plus other biochemicals that are not actually yet discovered yet in that turmeric plant other than just the curcumin. And so it's the same thing. We're kind of like zeroing in on one thing, just the output, just yeah. the yield of the corn. And we're not thinking about the rest of the full picture, which is the biodiversity, the soil, the bugs in there, the the symbiotic crops, nature factors, super weeds that can come up. We're, we're not thinking about any of these things. We're just, again, thinking about profit and how much corn can we grow. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. And then lastly, obviously, uh, Monsanto TM crops require the spraying of glyphosate, which is that pesticide we talked about earlier. And there have been some instances. Is it lymphoma? What were the types of cancer that were happening? It's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And there was a really uh, infamous trial that happened a couple years ago. There was a groundskeeper of a school and he was wearing uh, glyphosate as a backpack because they use oh. it commonly. This is really concerning. Uh, if you're a parent, I would if you can look into what your school is spraying on the grounds. Uh, but they were spraying it all over the grounds of this school and there was a leak and it was leaking on his back. And I encourage everyone listening to go Google the photos because they're absolutely horrifying. I mean, he literally got a, the most insane looking chemical burn I've ever seen wow. all over his body. Because In the moment, he didn't realize until he got home later. And he ended up developing non-Hodgkin's non lymphoma from mm -hmm. it. And he won a case 
against with Monsanto, against Monsanto. Or, 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 or they already bought by Bayer, so he he won against I'm Bayer. Trying to remember, I think when <clears throat> Bayer bought Monsanto, that they were in the middle of the trial. Yeah, so yeah, I think mm -hmm. so. Yeah. yeah, but he won, and I believe another farmer has won. But essentially, these farmers are getting cancer from being yes. exposed. There's also a is it a river that runs through? Yeah, it runs through five states. They call it the um, – There's they have a name for it. I want to say they call it like the River of Death or something. Yep. It's something like that. Yeah. And it's essentially all the industrialized – uh, food. All these agro chem chem chemicals are ending up in the water, basically it's from the hub farming. Because there's so many yes. Monsanto corn farms around there that yes, all exactly. of that glyphosate runoff is going into the river. And people who live in cro close proximity to that river and that stretch of land They're are getting cancer, having very high cancer rates. There's this woman that I follow. I want to say it's momcologist on a mission. Yes. Okay. I need to. Yeah, I follow her. Um, I believe that she she's not accepting any new followers. Okay, maybe because it's dangerous out here. But <laughs> I think her son ended up getting cancer from living near that area, and she's been on a mission ever since to essentially put answers out there for people. So it's a it's a wild thing. So glyphosate is certainly um, a risk factor when we're being exposed to it in our water, in our food, in our air. Like you mentioned, schools are often sprayed with glyphosate, the parks or, you know, parks, essentially, yeah. or even our public parks. So there's certain things that we can try to do, right? We can call into our representatives, to our local council and ask that, you know, start a petition that we don't want glyphosate sprayed on our local parks. We can vote with our dollars for foods that do not contain genetically modified corn and soy. But when we're thinking about these actionable tips, now that people really understand the dangers, what should we do here in this realm of GMO foods? Yeah, I mean, I would say first and foremost, look for non-GMO project verified. And also, if you can afford it, buy organic. Uh -huh. Because organic, by law, is not allowed to contain genetically modified food, and they are not allowed to use glyphosate. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, there's some misconception that organic means no pesticides and herbicides whatsoever. There's just a very small number of pesticides and herbicides that are allowed on organic mm -hmm. crops, mm -hmm. and they don't allow glyphosate, which to me is the biggest issue. Agreed. Agreed. And yeah. that's why also I'll still buy tomatoes or apples or whatever. I'll, if I'm going to the farmer's market and it's not a certified organic stand, I'm fine with that. Or even if I, if I need to go to a local market and get produce that's not organic, as long as I know it's not one of the genetically modified crops, I'm okay yeah. with that because I want to avoid glyphosate. Yeah. So especially buying organic when you're getting edamame, right? That's soybeans. When you're getting tortillas, try to buy organic there as much as possible. I would also with your grains. So the EWG actually did a, a study came out recently where they tested a bunch of really popular grain-based products on the shelves, mm -hmm. and they found 60 to 70% of them all had very concerning levels of glyphosate. And these were Cheerios, Quaker Oats, huh. things like that. So anything grain-based, because we're actually spraying glyphosate on wheat uh, after it's being harvested to dry it out. Mm -hmm. So there's no washing this off. It's on the grains itself. So I would say be careful with the grains that you're buying too. So it's on oats as well because they're grown near some of so, these crops that are sprayed or they're on wheat as they're well? Spray, they spray it on oats and they also spray it on wheat. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So is there a list or like a database online where we could find brands of – because I eat oats every day. I do the Bob's Red Mill gluten-free ones. Maybe those have glyphosate. <laughs> I'm not sure. I think those ones are actually pretty good. Okay. There's two brands that I really like. Uh, there's one called One Degree Farms, and they test. Yes. They're amazing. Yes. I use the, – they have the sprouted oats. Yes. I do the sprouted quick oats at home. I couldn't find them in a grocery store here, so I need to go find them. Yeah. They're really good, and they actually third-party test for glyphosate residue. And then there's one other one I want to say they're called pro oats or something mm -hmm. I'll have to I can give it I can give you a link afterwards if you want to put it in the show notes yeah but those are the two ones specifically that I know that are actually testing for glyphosate yes but this is why things like oats um any wheat-based products so like breads etc you really want to be buying organic because they're actually spraying it directly on those crops wow okay yeah. that's really good to know and that's also it kind of simplifies things when you are eating simply and eating real foods because yeah. if you're someone who like me, I eat, you know, maybe five ingredient oats every day. I'm using oats and chia seeds and some protein and almond milk and whatever. Um, I can control for that the biggest ingredient, which is the oats. And I can choose a brand like one degree that I know doesn't yes. have glyphosate. And I know every single day my morning oats, I'm not going to be exposed to that pesticide that I want to avoid. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, this is one that we really have to be proactive on. Yeah. Because I don't want to scare people, but there was a test that came out, a study that came out last year that showed that something like 98% of Americans have glyphosate in their blood. Yeah. We're finding it in rainwater. 
Well, that's the thing. Now it's like, ubiquitous. Exactly. So it's it is unavoidable. We're all going to be exposed to some degree. Exactly. But in terms of the foods that we're ingesting, we're going to get in the rainwater and maybe tap water, even filtered water. I don't know if you can filter out glyphosate, but um, in the foods that we're directly ingesting each day, how can we choose brands that are actually checking for those things? So maybe when you're yes. at the grocery store, Google the brand and see if they have any sort of testing for glyphosate. See if any other, you know, companies like Food Babe or someone has taken them to a lab and tested to see if there's yes. glyphosate. There's information out there. Yeah, there's a website called Momovation. I don't know if you're aware of her, but mm -hmm. she does a lot of her own just third party testing wow. for stuff. Yeah. And I don't know specifically if she's done glyphosate, but I wouldn't I would be shocked if she hadn't. Okay. And she sends in, I mean, everything from pots to pan pots and pans to different food brands. Yeah. And then she posts the results on her website. So mm -hmm. I I would encourage people to go look at that. Also, another one, just from a shopping standpoint, there's something called the Dirty Dozen, mm -hmm. where they release this every year. And it's a list of the food products that are most heavily sprayed with pesticides. They generally tend to be the same dozen every year. Mm -hmm. It's fruits like uh, or like berries specifically like yeah. strawberries are very they are notorious for having really high levels of pesticides on them okay raspberries blueberries things like that where you don't have an outer layer that you're cutting through versus like a banana or an avocado yeah they have that added skin that layer of skin outside so you're not going to be getting as many pesticides yeah that makes sense and also it's easier to buy and afford organic foods when you're eating in season because yes. the strawberry the strawberries are going to tend to be on sale even the organic ones in strawberry season. Yeah. So if you're eating seasonally and kind of paying attention to what's fresh in your climate at that time, you can often get better deals and swing a bit more of your budget towards the organic foods. Yeah, absolutely. And if you have accessibility to a farmer's market, I mean, that's a great way to also learn about le meet your farmers that mm -hmm. are growing your food, you know, and a lot of them, if they're a smaller business, you kind of said this earlier where you were like, I'm more inclined to buy them, even if they're not certified organic. A lot of them, you can just ask them, do you use pesticides? Yeah. Because a lot of them just can't pay for the certification because the organic certification is really expensive. Yeah. So meeting the farmers that are growing your food and learning about the practices that they yeah. do is also a great way. And a lot of farmers markets take food stamps. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. I know. So you really can cool. actually use any sort of government assistant towards those stands. So the farmers are also, it's like it's putting money in the right people's hands. Yes. Yes. Um, so it's a beautiful thing. Okay. I love that. Any other specific food products besides the grain-based cereals and whatnot that we need to look out for with glyphosate? For glyphosate? Um, no, it really is the grains and the GMOs where they're spraying it the most. And then obviously the, I would look at the dirty dozen because okay. they're, they are spraying it on all of our crops. Yeah. Unless if they're organic. Okay. So look for the ones that have the less pesticides. Okay. Okay. And dozen. really watch your tortillas and your tortilla, tortilla chips and things like Doritos that are made out of corn. That's all yes. going to be genetically modified corn. Those are all going to be bioengineered. Yeah. So yeah. I, I always try to buy organic tortillas. That's one thing because I eat a lot of tortillas or a different tortilla that's not corn based, right? A Siete Foods cassava tortilla. Yeah. Something like that. Um, just kind of substituting corn. A lot of people have issues with corn. And I think products. it's because we're eating so much of it. I'll try to simplify this so people can remember this. Just know that uh, almost all of the corn and the soy in this country is genetically modified. So it is safe to assume that if it's not labeled non-GMO or organic, just assume that it's genetically modified. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then supporting the farmers at the farmers markets who are growing a whole bunch of different types of crops and are using those symbiotic, maybe biodynamic yes. farming practices that aren't necessarily paying for the organic certification, but they're giving back to their soil in a good way. Ask them if they let the land rest. Like, you know, that yeah. that's a really important thing that's too. That's part of regenerative farming too. Actually letting it rest. Yes. So maybe tell us a little bit more about regenerative farming. What is that? Yeah. So it's essentially just a practice of farming where you're leaning in and working with nature instead of against her. Because what we're doing right now is really working against nature, right? The, the tilling, the spraying and doing all these inputs regenerative farming is going back to um, what does nature do when we're not around yeah. essentially you know and you oh, think nice. about right like you think about um buffalo used to be roaming all over the united states and they would move right they'd move in packs they wouldn't stay in one little place they move they, this is actually so beautiful when you think about it so seeds would get caught in their fur and they would just be planting seeds as they'd be moving along 
And their manure is a great fertilizer for the land. And then also their hooves are pushing those seeds into the land. And as they're eating the grass, it's also creating this carbon sequestration that's happening because there's this thing that happens. Uh, Gabe Brown, this farmer, actually talked about it on my podcast where when they take a bite out of the grass, it like signals something to the plant to then bolster down and it like pulls carbon out of the atmosphere. It's so crazy how this wow. mechanism – I know – and so what regenerative farming is doing when they incorporate the animals, which are actually a really important part of this whole ecosystem, they rope off portions of their land. So farmers that are practicing this, what they'll do is they'll have a little area where they allow them to roam and graze and poop and you know do all their things. And then they'll rope that part off, let it regenerate rest. They move the animals to a new part of the land. They do the same thing and they just kind of move them all throughout the land. So they're not just trampling one little spot and killing all the plants with their hooves. Wow. Oh it's my really goodness. cool. Which is wild because we hear that animal agriculture is what's causing climate change. But if you yeah. do it correctly, you can actually sequester carbon and give back to the environment. Oh, yeah. Anytime anyone says that, you have to look back in history. We had more ruminant animals on our plains mm -hmm. in the early 1900s than we even have now. Yeah. When you look at the buffalo, we killed most of the buffalo off. We did. Yeah. Which is really sad. Unfortunately. So that's not what is contributing to climate change. The way that we're doing it right now with the CAFOs, the factory farming, which is absolutely atrocious for the animals. And that's also a part of what's contributing to climate change. But a lot of it is this monocrop agriculture. I know. A lot of it is actually corn and soy, but they yeah. want to kind of put the blame on, on the meat. On the meat. And also, yeah, not to say that factory farming isn't doing something terrible to the environment and also climate change. Hello, huge corporations that are polluting, that are exactly. Shein. I want to blame Shein more than Me I want to blame meat. Me Go, too. You know what, McDonald's keep making the burgers because Shein is the problem. <laughs> Seriously, it's, it's, it's so true. Though. We're just not thinking of these other industries and we want to put the focus on meat. And there's just such a, an agenda, it feels like right now, to make meat bad and give us all impossible burgers. And I just don't want one. Well, and I think about too, yeah, I don't... <laughs> I definitely don't want an Impossible Burger. <laughs> They're so gross. But you think about it too. Impossible Burger is made in a factory. Yeah, exactly. So it's emitting... what are the emissions exactly. that are going into creating? I was talking to my husband about this, about um, electric cars as well. Yes. And the the way that the batteries, I think, are not going to degrade in landfills. Oh, yeah. And also the way that we need to mine certain minerals and oh, the yeah. emissions that are created because now they're needing – their batteries are so heavy that they need to make these electric-powered trucks to move the battery. There's a whole thing. Not only that, no one thinks about this. What do you do to charge your car? Where do you think you're getting that charge from? Fossil fuels. <laughs> It's not any better. You're going all the way around the loop <laughs> just to use fossil fuels again. And they use fossil fuels to create everything on the inside of the car, too. Yeah. You know, the, the door siding and yeah. the console and everything. It's really, it's... Not that I want a gas-guzzling GM from the no. 50s, but it's just there's a happy medium there. Yes. And it just it seems like we need to read a lot further into what we're being told is the, quote, better alternative TM. Yeah. You know? I agree. Okay, so another area that you and I may have more in common than we think, yet have differing opinions on the surface, is seed oils. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, we're both close friends with Krista. I listened to your episode on Almost Thirty. You guys are talking a lot about seed oils and yeah. and oat milk, and I am an oat milk stan. Okay, <laughs> it just it tastes so good to me. Out of all the plant milks, for whatever reason. My microbiome wants the oat milk. It wants the sunflower oil, okay? And so because it brings me pleasure, I will once in a while do the oat milk yeah. in the context of balance. But there's also something to be said about too many seed oils, but I don't believe that seed oils are, quote, toxic. So can you kind of give us your view? Yeah. So I think the seed oils thing is – it's nuanced, right, as most things are. My biggest issue that I have with seed oils above all else is that they are in everything mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Like you just said, we're finding it in our oat milk. We're finding it's similar to sugar. I mean, it, they're just in everything now. I feel like every package I pick up, I'm finding it in my supplements now. Yeah. Whereas five years ago, it was not in the supplements. So that's my biggest concern. And there's a ratio of omega threes to omega sixes, which I know you are both in alignment on. Yeah. Where it's it's skewing that ratio that we need in order for it to be healthy for us. Yeah. And we're skewing past the point of where it's healthy and it's become inflammatory because we're consuming it so much. There is also a concern of that oxidative um, factor where, and I talked about this yes. on that podcast, 
well, what are people doing when they're putting oat milk in their coffee? They're heating it up to a really high temperature and it's causing it to oxidize that fat. Mm -hmm. And this is something we do know does cause inflammation. So yeah. that's really my biggest issue. And then also on top of that, a lot of these oils were made because they're industrial waste products. Exactly. That's an issue. So that's the thing. It all goes back. I'm so with you here. It all goes back to the industrialization of food. When we needed to, when we were feeding people now in restaurants instead of at home, or when we were putting fats in packaged foods yeah. that we needed large quantities of, we went to these you know, quote, seed oils, but just whatever, plant fats, essentially, plant oils that were easy to extract and could we could get in large quantities because maybe they were a byproduct of something else that we needed. And we weren't thinking about nutrition first. We were just like, how, what plant can we get the most oil out of and put everywhere? Yeah. And one of those things is canola oil, which is genetically modified. So for me, I am, I'm really no canola oil. I really try to avoid canola oil as much as I humanly can because I really do not want to support GMOs ever with my dollars. But something like sunflower oil or like a grapeseed oil um, or safflower oil, those to me are a little bit less noxious than a canola. However, like you said, there's no world in which we should be eating three square meals that are fried in, seed, in plant oils. Exactly. That's just so Take it back to what is an omega-6 and what is an omega-3? Yeah, so omega-3 – well, so omegas are essential fatty acids that we need that we get through our diet. And we're finding it in all of our everyday products, products that used to not have oils in them at all. Yes. And I don't know if it's just because we have a surplus of it now and so companies are selling it because they're like, we have so much. we got to get rid of it. Like where can we throw it into that's cheap and effective and – um, yeah. And omegas obviously are a very healthy part of our diet and we need them. Mm -hmm. But if that ratio gets skewed, that's where we go into inflammation. Yeah. And so many Americans are in this chronic state of inflammation. And it's funny, like inflammation is always demonized. Inflammation has a role that it plays. And it's really important. You want inflammation when you have a cut, for example, because that's what heals your cut. Yeah. But if you're in a chronic state of inflammation, after a while, your body is putting so much effort into that inflammation that it's not able to deal with anything else in your body. And that chronic underlying inflammation is what is leading to so many of these diseases that we're dealing with right now. And just to break it down, because sometimes I think the word chronic inflammation or infl causes inflammation can feel ominous where it's like, okay, but how does it cause inflammation? And there's a really clear mechanism. I don't know if you've ever talked about this before, but um, maybe you can explain for us or I could break it down for a sec. But essentially the fats that we eat, the fatty acids, right? Ideally maximum four to one omega-6 to omega-3. So yes, you can have some plant fats, some seed oils, but you want to be balancing that with enough omega-3s and you don't want to be eating too many seed oils. The fats that we eat in that ratio becomes essentially the ratio of lipids and the types of lipids that make up our cell membranes. Yes. So have you chatted about this before? And Not really, okay. but I know it plays a role in our hormones, but yes. I can't speak to it as well as probably you can. Well, I just think it's so cool to understand like, oh, that's why it's causing the inflammation. So if you're someone who's eating a one-to-one -one or even as high as a four-to-one ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, that means that similar ratio is going to go into the actual fatty membrane of each and every one of your cells. Because every two years, Years, let's say our cells are fully recycled in some way and and now we're made up of the fats that we ate for those two years yeah so your cells will be made of the fatty acid ratios and types that you eat in your diet and what happens is each and every day the the fatty acids and the lipid membranes of our cells basically send out these cell signaling molecules called prostaglandins that determine our inflammation levels and mm. so um so a certain ratio of fatty acids within our lipid membranes causes us to produce a pretty happy balance of pro-inflammatory prostaglandins and anti-inflammatory prostaglandins. But if our cells have a skewed ratio, if we're eating the standard American diet where we're eating out three times a day and maybe our eggs in the morning are fried in canola oil and then our lunch has a dressing with safflower oil and then our dinner has French fries that also has canola oil, we're going to be having cells in our body that are made of too many omega-6 fatty acids, the wrong types of fatty acids, and we're going to produce more pro-inflammatory prostaglandins. And these pro-inflammatory prostaglandins can not only contribute to chronic pain, because for example, when you take a Tylenol or an NSAID, those drugs work by blocking prostaglandins. That's literally mm. what they do. So those prostaglandins are going to create inflammation and also are going to do things like worsen our period cramps. Yeah. It's our ratio of prostaglandins that determines the amount that we cramp and the pain that we experience during our menstrual cycle. So that's where the, quote, inflammation comes from because those fats become you. You are made of what you eat. You know what's really fascinating? There was a study that just came out within the last couple of years that they found that the, some of these oils – 
are actually living in our body for up to two years in our fat cells. That, it's so probably that's probably that, that mechanism. You know, my friend Michelle from. Shapiro, she's a registered dietitian, and she was talking yeah. to me about this, about the two-year thing. Yes. So maybe I'll ask her if she can send me the study, and I'll put that yeah, in the show Yeah, we should notes. link that. It's a pretty famous – a lot of people have been referencing that recently because that's part of the argument that people are concerned about. Yeah. Is they're like, we're eating so many, and then every time you eat them, they're stored in your body for up to two years, yeah. according to this study at least. And also, okay, we're also eating a lot of deep-fried foods. That's the yes. thing. A lot of times when we order – out, it's foods that are not just made with seed oils, but they're deep fried in seed oils that have yeah. a high omega-6 content. So we're just consuming too much of those fats. It's not that they're inherently bad, but it's that when you look at the context of your whole diet, do you really need more of them? No. Yes. If you're someone who has a very balanced diet and you're taking your fish oil, you're eating wild fish, you're choosing um, grass-fed meat that has a higher omega-3 and CLA ratio, and then you have a little oat milk with sunflower oil, probably not going to get you. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. But if yeah. you're someone who's chronically inflamed, you don't want to add fuel to the fire, essentially. Exactly. And if you are eating out a lot consistently, most of those restaurants are using soybean or canola oil. Yes. And going back to what we were saying earlier, those are both genetically modified. Yeah. So they're going to have a higher pesticide rate and they're just not going to be as good for us. So let's do some real life application. So yeah. what does this look like? Because we're all going to eat out at restaurants. I love a good restaurant moment. I know you do too. Me too. We like to be fancy girls. Yeah. So even if we're not at a fancy restaurant, most of the time, again, when I'm in Yonkers, my family and I were going to a random Italian restaurant or like a hole in the wall. And there's not, there's never going to be a wild fish op on, option on the menu. No. There's never going to be a heritage chicken. So what does that person do when ordering out at the restaurant? What, what's your order? So... I have a little bit of a relaxed approach when I eat out because I don't eat out a ton. Okay. So I, the way that I see it is if you really dial in your diet at home, because that's where you can control it, is making sure that you're buying the good oils. You're not eating things like canola oil. You're making sure that your omega threes to omega six ratio is on. Then you have your body has that resiliency to when you go out to eat, mm -hmm. you're going to be okay because you're at your threshold. You're in that ratio. Exactly. So I'm the mind that I would rather go out to eat with my friends, enjoy my time, than have to worry and stress about that. Now, you, what you can do if you're really concerned or if you're someone that's eating out all the time, I would ask I would ask the restaurants, ask the waiter, what are they cooking in? If they say canola oil, ask them if they can cook it in olive oil or maybe butter if they have butter. Mm -hmm. Ask them if they can swap out those options. Don't go for the fried stuff because that is 100% guaranteed to be in canola or soybean or one of those other oil, peanut oil probably. Um, yeah. And so just, just ask questions, you know, and then if you, for a salad, for example, if you want to order a salad and you're really concerned about it, guaranteed that salad dressing has canola oil in it, mm -hmm. ask for just olive oil on the side. Yeah. A little olive oil and vinegar. Love olive oil moment. It's funny because when you said earlier about the packaged salad dressings containing sugar and being hyper palatable, I'm like, yeah, when I was younger and I used to eat, um, Marie, What's the calendars? Marie calendars, yeah. blue cheese dressing. You kidding me? I would eat a boatload of that stuff. <laughs> I would not be able to stop. But yeah. I've never wanted to binge on olive oil and vinegar. You yes. know, it's not hyper palatable, which is a big plus. It's not acid oil, which is a big plus. So still get that salad. Order all the veggies at the restaurant. Get the really delicious salad. Just kind of make your own dressing. Yes. Or like you said, I, this is – it's more my question for the person who's eating out all the time. They're always having work lunches or they don't have time to cook. And it's just a lot easier to order, especially from a cheap restaurant or even a diner, right? There's yeah. things you can do. If you want to look at eggs, for example – a great way to make sure that they're not going to cook them in oil is to do hard-boiled eggs or poached eggs. Yes. Right? Exactly. And then toast with butter, right? It's – you're avoiding those oils. Yep. So you want to look for the things on the menu that are not going to be cooked in oils like that, mm -hmm. you know? Or for example, like I said, you can ask if you're going to get a steak, like ask them to cook it in olive oil or butter. Yeah. Because a lot of them have that too. Yeah. Butter or like even grilling it. Cooking grilling method it. is another thing. Like – You could even say don't cook it in oil at all. Yeah. Like saute yeah. it in like a broth or something. Yeah, absolutely. A good old – like ordering things that are boiled or steamed or like specific requests. A lot of times restaurants will accommodate you. Even for me when I'm ordering from like a local restaurant that's not at all bougie and does not make most accommodations, I can always get some grilled chicken. I can always get some steamed broccoli, yeah. some steamed white rice. You know, I can always kind of and, – and yeah, it's maybe it's definitely not as fun as getting the fried thing on the menu. And so save that for the special occasions when yes. you're with the girls and you're having fun and you – don't want to care about anything. But if you're eating out consistently, it's the cooking method. It's just asking, hey, do you mind cooking this in some butter? It's those little requests that change everything and then can change the fats that you're made of and your inflammation levels. It's it's amazing. Yes. And if you're in a situation where you are really eating out a lot, I mean, this is extra, 
But you could bring your own olive oil with you. Buy like a little tiny one and put it in your purse and mm -hmm. use that on your salads. You oh, know? yeah. I mean, really I bring the... tinctures everywhere. So oh, why wouldn't yeah. I bring a little olive oil? <laughs> Glucose bitters, olive oil. I love it. Food. Good. <laughs> Good to go. No, I love that. And I love your tip of ordering the salad because then you're also getting fiber and greens and vibrant veggies. And yeah, it's probably not organic, but still you're getting the fiber and the antioxidants. Exactly. And then if you're ordering oil and vinegar with it and a steamed or a grilled protein on top, and then maybe some steamed rice on the side, you're winning. And if you eat the salad first before you have your carbohydrate rich meal, it's actually going to help balance your blood sugar and it's not going to cause it to peak as high as it would. I love it so much. Yeah. Um, Anything else that we need to look out for when we're buying organic? Is everything really organic that says it is? Is there like a... So a lot of people ask me this question because unfortunately, like I mentioned at the very beginning of the episode, our governing bodies are actually not protecting us as much as we might think. But organic is really the best bet that we have right now. You know, there's more certifications that are coming out. Uh, I mentioned the glyphosate residue free. That's becoming a really big thing that you can look out for. Um, USD, USDA organic really is still pretty regulated. I mean, it's a federal crime if you say that you're USDA organic and you're not. Mm -hmm. So it is being more regulated than just conventional. Mm -hmm. And for now, that's all we've got, yeah. really, you know, outside of actually doing your own research, looking into certain companies and brands that you really love. Love. I mean, yep. something I've done, I've actually gone to uh, ranches for like specific meat companies that wow. I really love and seen their practices. And I have another one I'm going to go to soon. So you can actually really get involved if you want and find out what are the brands that are really doing right by your health and put yeah. your money into those companies. Wow. That's awesome. And also, like you said, farmer's markets, CSAs, yeah. um, even things like there's misfit produce, right? There's there's produce boxes um, that you can order online that are discounted. I think with the misfit produce, it's that they're the uglier, wonkier ones that the yeah. grocery stores don't want. And so you're getting them at a massive discount because they're not pretty, but they're perfectly good produce. Yeah. Um, so looking into produce deliveries, especially if you live in a food desert, because um, I know obviously not everyone has a farmer's market around them. So just trying to think of other ways we can get that produce in, even also at the farmer's market, looking for things like the the sourdough bread or the homemade bread instead of getting like the enriched wheat flour. Even yes. that is going to make a big difference in your health. It's these it really is the small foundational swaps, just starting where you can and not having to be perfect that can make a huge difference. Absolutely. There's also a company that's coming out um, more. You'll see them more on the shelves in like Whole Foods and Costco called One Mighty Mill. Mm -hmm. I actually had the founder on my podcast recently, and yeah. they are going back to a really traditional method of milling their grains. <gasps> and it's all organic. It's glyphosate residue free. And they are in the bread is incredible. Wow. I hope that they would say, are they selling the grains themselves or the bread? I think they said they were selling the grains at one point. I don't know if they're still okay. selling the grains Because that's another thing. I'm like, okay, well, the bread's probably not going to be available near me. Like, <laughs> you I know? know. And I that's where things like Thrive it. Market come in. I, that's another Thrive. thing I like. Yeah. So Thrive Market is cool because recently I was trying to order this pasta. Have you heard of Kaizen? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I haven't tried. It's like delivered at my house at home in New York yes. right now. So I can't try it yet. But I was looking at, they use like lupini beans and yep. it's a higher protein pasta. You know me, I'm a protein gal. Yes, good so luck. I looked on their site and it, you have to hit like a $100 minimum for the shipping. And I get it. Like it's, it costs a lot to ship things. I but know. I looked on Thrive and they had it. And so a Ooh, grocery yeah. membership like Thrive Market, especially if you live in a food desert and you're looking for um, healthier brands that are like maybe pastas and cereal grains and things like that. If you want to get the one degree oats that are glyphosate free, I'm sure that Thrive has to have them. I'm almost positive Thrive has them. Yeah, yeah. it's a really good service. It's, yeah. it's amazing. So you know, don't lose hope. If you li live somewhere where there's not a beautiful organic grocery store or a farmer's market or a CSA near you, there are these online services like Thrive Market or like the Misfit Produce where you can get things delivered to you. And it makes sense budget-wise when you're getting a good amount of groceries from there and getting grease free shipping and you're stocking up on bulk things. Yeah. Yeah. Thrive Market. I've been a member for a long time. Same. That's huge. I Same. love them. Yeah. I'm like a secret member. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I don't really talk about them. I guess people used to be more like sponsored to talk about them. So I feel like people are going to think I'm sponsored. But yeah, like, if you're like, I just love I've them. I've been a member forever. Um, okay. Amazing. Any other really cool things that you learned from the farmers on your podcast recently? <gasps> Oh, really cool things that I learned. Or anything that has just stuck out to you because you sound like you've been having great guests on your pod. Oh, my God. I've had so many. I'm really having a moment with regenerative farming right now. I'm trying to think of anything that I haven't shared, though. That That's I your really... next thing, Courtney the Farmer. I know. I love it. I want to, like, see you with the pitchfork. You know what's funny? I actually got a tarot reading the other day, and she was like, I see that, like, once you get married, you and your man are just going to be on land. <laughs> I was like, I feel that very much. Oh, my God. I would love that. I know. 
So yeah, I don't, I feel like everything that I've learned recently, I've already talked about like, okay. like the regenerative farming the side, all of that. Okay. Yes. Okay. I cool. highly recommend people watch kiss the ground. That one's already out on Netflix. <sighs> Love. It's so good. Yeah. The, the same did, maker yep, did the did new one, Common Ground. ground. Okay. Yes. So yes. Kiss the Ground – or no, Kiss the Ground, Common Ground. And those will both – Genetic Roulette. <laughs> yes, Genetic <laughs> three, Roulette. Three documentaries you need. And those two documentaries that we were just saying will give you so much hope. Like there's so much wrong going on right now in our food system, but there's also so many amazing people mm -hmm. that are working so hard to change our food system right now. Mm -hmm. And it's really – it's really heartwarming when you see those podcasts and you see that there are a lot of people that are paying attention to this issue and there's more and more people coming online to it every day. What was your biggest takeaway from Common Ground? Like what inspired you the most or like who's kind of getting in action there? Um, it just – it really gave me a lot of hope. So I actually went to the premiere and they were saying that at that theater, this is the most packed that they've seen it in years for this premiere – and everyone was so excited, so engaged. You could just feel the energy of the room. And this is a documentary about farming. Mm -hmm. Also, like, I, I didn't grow up in a farming family. I've never been involved in farming whatsoever. Yeah. And the fact that I am so passionate about this right now and really paying attention gives me hope. Yeah. Because so many people are starting to realize that there is a direct connection to the farmers and how they're growing our food and how we're treating our soil and how we're treating the animals to the health of us, but also the health of our planet. Mm -hmm. And when you start to make all those connections, it really, it gets you excited. Yeah. And there's a lot of hope because if we can get more farmers on board of this regenerative farming practice, we're not going to have to worry so much about climate change and all the other issues that we're dealing with right now. And I guess the action item there to get involved is to vote with your dollars for the companies that are regenerative yeah. farming. Yeah. Um, Everyone are... asks me all the time. I'm like, you're number one best way that you can get involved is by spending your money on the companies that are doing right by our health. Yeah. Yeah. And even if that means, I, I think there, there has to be a little bit of a reframe here too, because out of all of the major countries around the world, we are the ones that spend the least amount of money on food yeah. and we spend the most amount of money on our healthcare. Yeah. And we're not thinking about the true cost of what our food is not only costing, but what it's actually doing to our health. Mm -hmm. We think that food is cheap. It's actually really not that cheap. Mm -hmm. When you look at how much money we're spending on doctor bills, surgeries, medications. Yeah. And then not to mention, you can't put a price on your health. You're sick. You cannot put a price on that. I think it's because we're just not taught from a young age that food is medicinal. We kind of think that it has a net effect of zero either way. Yeah. And it actually has a negative or a positive depending on what kind of food we're eating. It's it's the easiest and, you know, lowest risk intervention to start with for any chronic illness or the prevention of a chronic illness. Exactly. It really has the power to impact you. Just, just getting a higher dose of nutrients and antioxidants and polyphenols and fiber in your diet every single day can shift everything from your cholesterol levels to heart disease risk. I mean, that's where to start is with the food and, and cooking and affects, at home. And it affects your mood. It does. 95% of our serotonin is made in our gut. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much for just this. It's, I feel very motivated. I feel angry about the GMOs all over <laughs> again, but I also feel motivated to take that extra step. I'm going to start looking a little bit harder at the glyphosate. I eat the one degree oats just because I liked the packaging and could tell they were a vibe, but I didn't even know that they had no glyphosate. So yeah. I'm just going to go that step further and really make sure that I'm looking into maybe the third party testing of the, the brands that I'm buying from consistently. Um, and we'll just continue shopping at my farmer's markets. And I hope that everyone listening, you're as inspired as I am by Courtney. Thanks for this beautiful conversation. Thank you. Um, please tell us where we can find you and about your podcast. Yeah. So I'm Real Foodology across the board. I'm mostly active on Instagram and then uh, my podcast. It's called the Real Foodology Podcast. It's on all major networks, Spotify, Apple, you name it. I'm there. Also, if you go to realfoodology.com, I have a grocery guide that has all of these tips that we talked about today, just in a really simple PDF that you can take to the grocery store with you. So if there's anything that you felt like you heard today and you're just like, oh my God, how am I going to remember all this? Go to my website. It's free. You just have to put in your email and it'll be automatically sent to you. I love that. Thanks for that resource. Yeah. Thank you. Beep. Wasn't that great?